is inflation targeting good or bad? All right? Um, it depends. And so I guess what I'll try and do in the 10, 15 minutes is to give you uh, three, three sorts of advice or three sorts of reflections. One is what I call ask the right question. Right? And that's critically important. The second is the data speaks and tells the stories. Right? And pretty much like, uh, what's it, Hansel and Gretel picked up the stones, follow the dotted line that is the data. It will lead you to places that you, that you never expected. And I'll give you examples. Uh, the third issue is, th is the one that actually came out through a lot of the discussion here, is that every issue cannot, right? Cannot, and I, and I strongly believe, should not be purely a normative one, right? Because the answers are too easy. Yes, we are pro-poor. Yes, we are, right? Um, uh, and then I'll end off with a, with a little bit of a, a challenge to, uh, to the local media. Um, so what I mean by ask the right questions, right? So part of the reflections we've, uh, so part, of, part of the questions that always seem to be posed in the media are, or in, in the stuff that I read is, is government pro-poor? Wrong question, right? Wrong question. First, and it's, it's linked to the second point. First, go and look at the fact that 40% of all, the bottom 40% of all households, right, their access rate to social grants is 70%. 70% on average of households in the bottom 40% of the population have access to some form of a social grant. Now, by some conception, that's probably the most pro-poor pro intervention of any middle-income country, uh, middle-income country, not any country, any middle-income country in the world. So it's manifestly a pro-poor state. The question you really should be asking is, what is it that makes the state that is ostensibly pro-poor on one measure, perhaps pro-poor or less pro-poor on another measure? Or are there aspects of state intervention with regards to that pro-poor intervention which are not sustainable, i.e. the fiscus or the fact that there are no wage earners in those households and all that sort of thing? And, and, and that's crucial. Uh, Another, another question that's always posed, should we have inflation targeting or not? That's the wrong question, right? The question really is, what's the relationship between prices and growth? What's the relationship between inflation and growth, right? You'll find that in, in, uh, there, there's a very rich, dry, some say it, rich, <laughs> academic literature on the relationship between inflation targeting and growth. There's this, there's this uh, awkward term called non-linearities in growth, in the relationship between prices and growth. What it means is that if you have really high levels of inflation, 50, 60 percent, it's really bad for growth. But at single digits of inflation, the benefits to growth of slightly higher inflation are less clear. There's a very serious academic debate that can be panel beated into something that's more media friendly. And that's at the heart of the inflation targeting debate, not about whether you should have inflation targeting or not. Um, uh, and my pet one, right, is racial and gender wage gaps, right? So how often haven't we seen um, a reflection of the fact that the average, and, and you see it in, in most media, local and international, the average female earns, right, 10,000 rand uh, a month, and the average male earns 15,000 rand a month. Therefore, the discriminatory gap is 5,000 rand. Wrong, right? Because... The average, what, if all, what if all the males that you were looking at had PhDs in engineering, right? And all the females, right, had PhDs or, or rather uh, had no degrees, right? That gap is not a gender gap. It's an educational gap, right? Um, and it's a very important nuance because it means that the problem is not gender discrimination but access to schooling that's differentiated by gender, right? Um, and... Uh, yes, it sounds, it's, it sounds too detailed and too confusing. Well, that's because the answers are never simple, right? Uh, it, it's never as simple as just saying, well, it's always race or it's always gender. Uh, and, and that's in, particularly in the context of, of wage gaps. And so what you'll find is that what economists do is that we actually estimate these things, right? We estimate these things called conditional wage gaps. So in other words, when you control, when you take account of education, location, quality of schooling, all those other factors, you find that the gender gap is X or Y, right? And that's really what, what matters. So asking the right questions for me. Um, so as a personal reflection, I can usually tell within the first paragraph in the article on, on, on the economic side and uh, less on the company news because that's, that's really dry. I mean, uh, 
the company new stuff, it's just running through standard stuff, right? But in, in, in the economic policy uh, uh, um, print media, you can usually tell in the first paragraph of the right questions are being posed, right? And if you see Julius Malema in there, then you know it's the wrong question, right? Because <laughs> it's just not about, uh, about personalities. So the second area I said I would focus on is the fact that the data speaks and tells the stories, right? And here, here I sort of implore you to follow the numbers. And, and the classic for me is budget day, right? How often haven't you looked at the budget speech given by the minister and the reporting the next day? And it's a cut and paste, right? Because, again, lying behind the minister's speech is this thing, thick thing called the estimates of expenditure. And actually in there are where all the nuggets are, yep. right? And the estimates of expenditure will tell you, did the real value of pensions go up or down? Nobody ever asks that question. We always say, well, pensioners are getting five rand more. Well, that doesn't mean anything, right? What really matters is where the real value, right, relative to inflation, whether the old age pension has gone up or down, right? Um, in most cases, the budget speech is, 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 is a dead rubber, right? Because the estimates of expenditure plan what they're going to be doing in the next three to four years, right? So the minister announces what, what he's already uh, told you two years before, in many cases. So, so the, the story about, about following the data in terms of the budget speech is don't look at the budget speech really, listen to it, and while you're listening to it, take the estimates of expenditure and look at those numbers. And look at the allocation, for example, proportionate allocations to social expenditure relative. How many people know, for example, that we spend the most on education relative to most middle-income countries in the world, right? So that's sort of permeated. But how many of you know that that expenditure has actually marginally declined as a share? as a share of total expenditure over the last three, four years, right? And those are the kinds of stories that, that have to be told. Um, the data. How often haven't we heard that poverty, poverty and inequality are rife and they've gone up? Well, that's wrong, right? Poverty's gone down, right? Inequality's gone up, right? And, and when we say poverty, what do we mean by poverty? Well, when we measure access to income, right? So when we measure, measure uh, not assets, right? When we look at wages, social grants, and so on, and you measure poverty in that way, that's gone down, right? Inequality, income inequality, has actually gone up. Because the data, if you follow it, tells a very interesting story about assets. So if you look at access to housing, access to water, access to electricity, and some boring academics, uh, one of them sitting here, has deri have derived an asset index, right, that actually allows you to measure poverty and inequality in a non-income sense. And guess what? Asset poverty and asset inequality, right, under Isup's watch and others, right, has actually gone down, right? So, so there's this odd sort of story about, well, gear and RDP and they can't oppose and... And to some extent, well, the numbers tell a very different story about assets on the one hand. So the delivery of these social services, does that mean that the problem's gone away? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that you've got a very different story when you look at assets versus income, when you look at poverty and inequality. And all those stories sit in these numbers, right? Um, and lastly on the data, this is my favorite one, is we start out by saying, um, so Dennis Davis yesterday on this pre-recording um, of, what's he called, J Judge for Yourself. He poses the question to me, he says, is our labor market rigid, right? Well, if you're a researcher, right, or an academic or an economist, you would often say, well, okay, how do you measure? Because we always want to measure everything, right? How do you measure labor rigidity? Well, there's this thing that the World Bank, it's nice because it's the World Bank, so you can, you can immediately claim that if I get a result that, that well, I'll explain further. The, the World Bank runs something called the Doing Business Survey where they actually measure labor rigidity. Uh, or, or labor laws, not the implementation, just the labor laws. So if you do the study, which we did with a bunch of equally dry lawyers, probably more dry than us, who the result was that if you compare the Doing Business Index on labor laws, South Africa looks exactly like any other middle-income country, smack bang in the middle, right? And so then you say, well, labor rigidity on the Doing Business Survey, which is a World Bank survey, right? We're actually not rigid at all. But then clearly this is a perception. There's something going on here. And so you follow the numbers again, and it tells you that it's something to do with the institutions of the labor market. And the, and the most, uh, if you like, informative story to support any notion that there's lack of flexibility in the labor market, it turns out, revolves around the labor courts. And that's it. 
That's it, right? It's not the legislation, it's not the CCMA, it's not dispute resolution, it's actually the labor courts. Um, and so the, you get there by a process of research and in fact actually analyzing the data and so on. And I think you can tell very interesting nuanced stories, right, about labor rigidity and labor flexibility. Instead of saying, Kusatu says we are not rigid and uh, uh, the business lobby feels that labor laws are a problem, which incidentally the private sector economists do all the time, right? We know that labor laws are a problem. Well, well where's the evidence, right? Show, show us the numbers. Okay, then uh, second, second, la second last issue which is, I, I do believe that every issue cannot and should not be purely a normative one. Um, and, and, and I'll give two examples, right? The first is, is inequality bad? So this is the, and I'm deliberately being controversial, right? Is inequality bad? So what would you say? Right, our, our normative response. Oh, thank you, it depends, <laughs> right? And that's the right answer, because it depends. Because our normative answer is always, well, yes, right? We want, you know, we want what John Lennon says, right? Yeah, it's a world free of poverty and, you know, imagine and, you know, we all want that. That's fine, right? But it is the real economy. It is the real world. And, and there is data, actually, and there is analysis showing the relationship between inequality and growth. And so is inequality bad? Well, it turns out at lower levels of inequality, right, or when you have um, um, medium levels of inequality or benign levels of inequality, that's not too bad for growth. Growth and inequality, in fact, work quite well together. What, what I mean by that is, you know, you, you allow small businesses to grow and flourish. You allow millionaires to become millionaires and so on, right? So, and, and you see that in most industrialized society where they have fairly low levels of inequality. The state then uses some of that revenue base and finances, um, finances redistribution, right, at the bottom end. And so lower levels of inequality allow, allow businesses to flourish, allow... Um, profits to be had, and all those things that, 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 that exist in a mixed economy, and the state then uses it. The problem with inequality, when it gets bad, is when you have excessively high levels of inequality. So excessively high levels of inequality, which is what we have, right, 0.69 on some measures of the Gini, are in fact bad for growth. They're bad for growth because they breed social instability, they breed crime, um, they, they lock networks out, right? They, they lock networks in, rather, to the privileged few like all of us and lock, lock everybody else out, whether it's access to credit, whether it's access to better quality schooling, uh, and, and so on. And so in that way, inequality is actually bad for economic growth. Another normative question is, uh, um, and, and, and I think Reg raised it, is high interest rates are bad. Are they? Well, it depends, right? Because <laughs> high interest rates are really good if you're a saver, right? Right? So um, my mom's not very happy when the interest rate drops, right? Because she's got a little bit of money that keeps her going on the interest return, right? Of the cash that was left for her. Um, and um, however, for investors it's bad, right? But what if I told you that high interest rates are really crucial for this carry trade, right? That we're trying to tax, right? So currency dealers make lots of good money out of high interest rate environment in South Africa. And we say that's a bad thing. Well. In the short run, guess what? It finances every single thing that you're consuming that's imported because it finances the deficit, right? So is there right and wrong? No, there isn't. And, and partly we love to joke about it as economists that well, on the one hand and the other hand, but, but that's, that's why the choices are so difficult, right? It's the art of the trade-off. It's the art of, of knowing what, the, um, what the, uh, the, 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 the correct point is to actually make that decision in favor of one or the other.